Dr. Alexandra Johnston, welcome to LingoFest. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Um, well, we are now in March, right? Early March. So what does that mean for, for you guys? It's like, this is crunch time, the end of the semester. Is that right? Yes, it's crunch time in a number of areas. <laughs> we, are, we have students who are applying for any number of internships and waiting to hear back. We have students that we're reviewing, prospective students we're reviewing applications and figuring out our cohort for the fall. So we're doing graduate student admissions and we're also gearing up for final projects for the classes that we're teaching. So it's a really busy time and I'm about ready to dive into spring break and just go undercover for a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, people who are listening uh, or watching as well, you know, they, they'll, they'll know that, um, that you, um, you are at Georgetown University. So tell us about um, your job at Georgetown. Uh, what do you do? Like you do a million things. And again, that's why I appreciate you taking the time. To, this is really crunch time and, and carving out a, a whole hour is, is just very generous of you. But tell, tell the audience, if you could, about what you do. Um, the many things that you do at Georgetown. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm really lucky. I have a university position that allows me to be a faculty member in the Department of Linguistics and teach academic linguistics, which is my area of, of academic training and expertise. I have a PhD in linguistics. And I can also be a career mentor to the graduate students and undergraduate students in our department. And I can connect those students with, and other people in career transition with the wide world of work outside of academia. So I feel I can liaise between the academic world in higher education and figure out how to translate the skills that students and graduates have in humanities and social science to really interesting career paths in business, government, nonprofit, and tech organizations. So I also, you know, deliver a lot of professional development training, helping students and other people work on their resumes for different sectors of employment, optimizing their cover letters, optimizing their cross-platform digital presence so that they have good LinkedIn's that get noticed, so that they have a website that can display their portfolio and I also prep them for, for interviews and how you have to position yourself uh, when you enter work outside of academia. So I love what I do. I love getting jobs for linguists and people in humanities and social scientists. No, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's really fulfilling. I thought I put this on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a symphony. Technology is so you're, tricky. You're the Jeez. discipline getting all these, all these things. <laughs> Uh, okay. No, I mean, it, it, it must be fulfilling, right, to like get these folks, you know, all ready and then close the deal and you see them launch into a career. Um, I mean, that, that really is, I can't get better than that, right? Can it? <laughs> no, I, I think that's one of the best things that I get to do is to, to get to work with really motivated, smart students who are honing their skills right at this, this launching point when they can take their degrees and, and move out into their first or second jobs outside of academia. And you know, hearing back that something that I've told them or the way that I mentored them or the way that they shaped their resume, the way that they shaped the stories that they tell about themselves, you know, got them a job at, at Apple or at Google or at a strategic communications firm, or in the federal government working, you know, with the intelligence community, that is so fulfilling, because they have the skills uh, that are needed by employers. It's just how they talk about them, how they present themselves, and letting employers know their value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I often say every organization needs a linguist, they just don't know it yet. So we have oh, to... Yeah. 
let them know. Absolutely. I mean, that is becoming uh, a must. I mean, uh, to, to have a linguist, I think I think it's becoming a must for big companies, medium companies, small companies. You need to have somebody who who, uh, who understands how to um, you know how to how to deal with language in many many different ways, right? Both technology as well as with other other dimensions. Um, so. Um, so a question, well, by the way, your students are all brilliant, at least all the ones that I've encountered and engaged with, a um, dozen of them or so. Um, I mean, they're not only bright, but also they are hardworking, um, and they're organized and, and all that. So that's, that's to be noted for sure. Um, but tell me, uh, what I've noticed about all students uh, is that there's this correlation being, being really smart and then being blind to what's out there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like there is this terrible thing, like they know all these things. And then and then so somebody like yourself is like, okay, look at all the opportunities, uh, which is, I mean, this is this is why your job is so fulfilling, is, is you have all these folks who are very smart, but they maybe they're not that aware of what they can do with what they have as far as skills. What do you think? I I agree. Not that they are they're they're unaware and that's unaware, that's yeah. natural because think of how we're mostly trained if we go to university you know even more so if we go on to a graduate degree there isn't a direct career path between a linguistics degree and the wider world of work uh, yeah. when we linguistics which is the scientific study of language in all its forms and all the ways we use language in society, the ways that we present ourselves, our communication patterns. That's a discovery major that most people don't know about in high school. So mm. if you have the opportunity in college to run into an intro ling course uh, because it's uh, general, it falls into general requirements or because they need something that fits their schedule that semester, you know, it's it's a major that many people don't come to, and they they especially don't know where it will lead because the people who are teaching linguistics are academics. They've gone as far as they can and gotten their terminal degree in this amazing field, and they've likely stayed within academia through their doctorate, become a professor, and then teach these the subjects mm -hmm. that they love. Mm -hmm. So the students have a model. Mm. of a professor who most likely has spent their entire career within academia or within you know closely related areas and so there's there are not a lot of models put before them of linguists who are out in the world and that's the majority of linguists you know only about five percent to ten or thirty percent of phd holders go on to become professors mm colleges and universities it really depends on the field for linguistics i would say maybe only about five percent five to ten at the most i mean we're in a mm -hmm. in a, a crisis in higher education as far as having placement for people with doctorates in higher education as assistant professors and moving through the ranks so if you don't have the models in front of you of linguists who have had these successful careers outside of academia, you don't know what's out there. So yep. you need somebody to come, you know, in, come back in. And, well, and, you are. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, kind of pull aside the curtains and say, the majority of linguists are out there doing amazing things in business, tech, government, and nonprofit, and you can too. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, the only reason I was saying, hey, the smarter you are, the blinder you are, is because I remember when I was in grad school, I mean, I was just, I just enjoyed studying, and I was in the library all day, and I was just hitting the books, and, and I didn't even think that there is such a thing as a job or a career. <laughs> you know, but we're not trained to think that. At way. all, at all. I mean, like... And I, I and I just assumed that okay, I'm gonna go to PhD, and then I when I was in PhD, and I was assumed I'm gonna be a professor and all that, and and then I, you know, I bumped into the real world and I found that my passion is not a, my passion is an innovator, right? Um, but it took it took uh, it took something to happen for me to wake up, right? And the earlier you wake up, I think, the better. Here's a question I have uh, for you, actually, which just uh, occurred to me as you were talking. 
you know, um, athletic departments, right? They go and they scout. They scout in high school and they go and look for, and they go and find and they make offers and then they get them. How come, how come departments, other departments don't do that? How about, how, how come the philosophy department doesn't go around and scout and the linguistics department doesn't do that and the mathematics department? I want to just occur to me that those guys, they, they are up to something that they go and they find them at high school and they just, you know, they find talent that is budding and they nurture it. What do you think? I, I'm just brainstorming with you, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there is recruitment that happens where uh, recruiters, so members from uh, staff in admissions from colleges and universities go visit high schools, or these mm. days they're visiting by Zoom um, mm. and providing virtual college visits, and they're providing information over these these virtual meetings to let students know about opportunities at an undergraduate university like as a whole. And you know, at that point, it may not be that they're recruiting for specific majors. Once the students get onto college campuses, there mm -hmm. are things like majors fairs. And mm -hmm. we have, mm -hmm. you know, our director of undergraduate studies goes to this majors fair and she mm -hmm. she brings, you know, attractive cookies with international. Yeah phonetic alphabet symbols on them and says, come major linguistics. Mm -hmm. So we, we do the kind of recruitment on campus once the students get there. But yeah. there's, there are fewer opportunities for students to learn about linguistics, per se, in, in high school. There are a couple mm -hmm. ways, though, that they can get involved if they hear about the international, uh, if they hear about the computational linguistics Olympiad, that's one mm -hmm. way to get involved. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. part of those, that series of STEM Olympiads, if high school students want to get involved in these competitive, you know, problem solving events, they can, they can search up the. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if like journalism schools go to high schools that have a newspaper and they go and try to get those, those kids who are involved in, you know, in, in, in journalism to, to come over because it just feels like there is. Uh, there's, I mean, it's it's become a science uh, for sports, right? The way they do it, they go oh. and they watch from afar and they ask questions and they and they have just a whole system. Over decades, they've been doing it. So maybe there's something to learn from those guys. I think maybe. I'd be up for it. I would go to high schools and I would say, you know, yeah, we can yeah. spot talent. You know, I mean, you can spot them. You can spot even you can spot them like somebody who knows how to write. Uh, you know, uh, like wow. Uh, and they're not even aware that there's uh, something called linguistics. Exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so you and I, we we connected. I don't even remember how we connected, but we connected via the. Um, uh, so, I, 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 as you know, I'm a big believer that the tech sector can definitely benefit from an infusion of folks in the humanities. Um, and um, and for instance, in the case of human language technology, obviously linguistics and uh, and some other majors, but mainly in linguistics. And I think I think that was the conversations that we um, we started, you know, with is okay. You guys, um, I mean, you yourself. I think um, I don't I don't think that there is one of you in every department in Georgetown, for instance. No, no. <laughs> and I don't think there is one of you in linguistics departments in other universities. So sort of, I mean, for me, it makes a lot of sense what you're doing. What doesn't make sense is that other people are not doing that. So that's one thing, right? So yeah. I, was, I was happy to encounter somebody like you nearby, right? Because I'm in the DCM McLean nearby mm -hmm. um, in a great school. Um, and I think, uh, I think since then, your um, your students launched this uh, this um, this thing called the Human Language Technology Group, right? A couple of students, very bright students. Well, everybody's bright over there, but a couple of them who are sort of like they were bubbling and they wanted to do something, and they've they've gone and I don't even know where they are in terms of uh, of the thing. They just took and ran, took and ran with. And I love those kinds of people. They just took it and ran with it, right? So where, uh, tell me about that and your involvement in that and, and what you're doing specifically with, the, with this vertical that's emerging where there's a lot of opportunity, massive opportunity. I think we're just scratching the surface, right? Um, not only just voice, but human language technology, broadly speaking. Um, tell me, tell, tell the folks a little bit about your engagement in that. Great. Well, I think we can start specific and then broaden out. So 
going back to the group that began at Georgetown, this human language technology group, it's it comes out of you know part of our cult, the culture in our department that there are many student run interest groups and research groups and reading groups and this was a group that had a lot of exposure through through our association and mm. through other other people in the conversation design world in the voice user interface world uh, voice first world um, that over time over about say a year, a year and a half, being gradually exposed to people who are using linguistics in, in those spaces proved really, you know, like a catalyst for mm. these students, you know, in particular, Zhang Ying Ko, a mm -hmm. doctoral student in sociolinguistics um, and, and her colleague, it provided this catalyst that said, you know, this is something that we can do. And if we want to position ourselves well in this space, <clears throat> we have to show products. We have to show mm -hmm. results, deliverables. And so they got together and with, with you and I kind of advising them on both sides, mm -hmm. and me from, from the, on the department mm -hmm. side and, and you with your industry experience and, and leadership, they developed a, a schedule of going through the product development process mm -hmm. um, to create Alexa skills, to create a publishing schedule so that they could release articles on Medium mm -hmm. and then put those on LinkedIn and get traction that way. They've been attending you know, voice lunch meetings, mm -hmm. language and linguistics and giving presentations there. Mm -hmm. They've attended LingoFest that you mm -hmm. hosted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so all of these these factors really, you know, push them to to get right on track with producing something over the course of the academic year, and and then seeking out the resources they need. Yeah, yeah, and one of them actually got a job with uh, Comcast, right? Yeah. Huli, I think yes, Huli. Huli. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. So she's on hiatus from her program so that she can get this really important professional yeah. experience that she oh, will yeah. later. So kids over there are you listening, you know, okay. So there's a real, <laughs> it converts to real things like jobs, uh, yes. you know, thanks to, uh, to folks like uh, Alex um, and her leadership. Um, so that's great. And then the, uh, is, um, are they pulling folks? I need to go and sit down and just get an update from them. Are they pulling folks from uh, other departments, from like, uh, I don't know, from linguistics, of course. Like, uh, did they get somebody from computer science to help them develop, code things up so they can focus on their core competencies? Do you know? Right now, the, the, the teams that have developed within this group, because they're working, you know, with this team approach, as, mm. as you should, you know, to take on different roles and yeah. drive projects. Yeah. To completion, uh, the teams are entirely within our department. They hmm. do have a goal to enlarge the group. Yeah. But this year was a pilot year. No, to, that's fine. I think I think the fact that they divided their labor is great because yeah, yeah. now they understand the roles. That's the key thing. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, and they they've learned. They're learning. You know how to define your role within the team. How to talk about your role um, to other people, so that when you're when you're networking, you can clearly describe your contributions and mm -hmm. what the team is driving towards. So in all aspects of career management and preparation for the future, they're really just doing the real work that will launch them in, in a variety of career paths. They could go yeah. in a number of places. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was, interviewing, I was interviewing somebody last week uh, for LingoFest. Uh, her name is Amy Stapleton. And it's interesting because we went through her, how she got, she, what she does is she has her own company, technology company, and they do uh, very interesting um, work on modeling, creating personalities for the Amazon Echo, those skills um, that older folks, you know, who are feeling isolated can have chats with, right? They can talk to them and it, and it you know, it's, it's actually, it's a lot of work to get something that to be interesting enough to talk to back and forth, right? Uh, so you so imagine, you know, all day long, you don't say anything and you don't have anybody to talk to. Maybe you can use this to just exercise your muscles and feel like, uh, you know, anyway, virtual reality in terms of conversation. Just think of it like that way. 
Now, what's interesting is that she started, she majored, she has, she had a PhD in German literature, right? That's what she, uh, that's where she started, right? But the key thing is, like you're saying, is she kept her eyes open. She was hired by a company to, to, to translate, a technology company to translate from, I think, German to English or vice versa, or whatever, right? Uh, and so she was in a technology company, right? And she, you know, language is very important uh, for her, right? Literature, right? And so she had uh, core competencies that other folks didn't have in the technology team. That they were able to leverage, right? Um, and so she got into the world of human and language technology, and um, she's made a great career of it, uh, and so forth. So it's all about you know knowing who you are and keeping your eyes moving and not constraining yourself. I think, like, oh, I'm a linguist, therefore I can do these. Oh, this technology, uh, you know, that's not me. In fact, you know, technology is just a tool, and, and what you have uh, are, are things that you can help other folks with, right? Absolutely. I, I agree. There, there are a lot of people who hear technology and have that reaction. Like, that's not me. I, I don't know how to code. They have certain associations exactly. with what it means yeah. to, yeah. to uh, work with technology and to develop it. And they don't, they aren't aware about how work is structured and what workflows are like in most organizations, how you work with a team with people who have different core competencies that, you know, then is part of this distributed knowledge of the team so that people who come in with expertise in language, literature, political science, history, mm -hmm. people who know about, about people, people who understand pattern recognition, systems yeah. thinking, people with good oral and written communication skills, people who people, know how yeah. to organize large people who know how to talk to people. Yeah. Right? No, seriously. Like play well with others. Yeah, yeah. That's all really necessary. So I, I try to encourage uh, people that I work with to think of technology differently. Um, to think of it, yeah, as a, as a tool, as a product, a service that can help people, that allows you to be an advocate for others, um, just in the way you might feel you're an advocate for others if you join a nonprofit organization and you, you try to help other people. If you have a desire to help and provide value and to, to advocate, you can do that in so many different types of organizations and through so many yep. types of tools and teams. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I've always worked in technology companies and a, and a technology company is only a small, small portion of a team that launches a product are engineers. The other ones are marketers, they are designers, they are researchers. That's why I was talking about people who know how to talk, about, to talk about other people, right? So if you're doing UX research, you need to be able to uh, to know how to go and speak with someone, make them feel at ease and have an ear and pause and all that. Those are not skills of a technologist or engineer, right? Those, those are totally the opposite <laughs> of, of what engineer does. <laughs> Most of them, are. I don't want to. But in any case, I mean, so that's why I think awareness of, you know, there is a UX researcher and the designer. None of these are technologists. And then there is the actual coder, okay? And, and there are... It's a small team, actually. And then there's people who, who test it, who are not coders, who test it for functionality and for usability. There are people who just test and they just know they have a knack for testing stuff and finding things that are not highly usable and they know how to, to formulate and explain to the engineer what's wrong with it. And then there's the product manager who's usually not a, uh, who's somebody who's overseeing. So those folks have the, you know, the skills of being able to deal with all kinds of folks with conflict, you know, and all of that, right? And so if you see, if you look at the whole collection of these folks, a tiny version, a tiny portion of them are engineers. Everybody else is, you know, whatever, linguist or communications major or writer or a, an anthropologist who, has, who knows how to go to the field and collect information and so forth. So hopefully, you know, we continue, you and I and, and all of our colleagues who are doing the same thing, we continue repeating the message 
you know, go and, 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 and check it out. You know, I guarantee you there's a place for you there if you want to be part of it, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is is translating. Yeah. Which, I mean, and what what do linguists know, but language and translation and how to understand different patterns of, of speaking and communication. So for example, so many of the skills that you just mentioned, usability testing or developing rapport so that people can interview others and mm -hmm. follow others as they do a think aloud protocol, working through, um, you know, looking at a product or service. These are the methods of qualitative research in mm -hmm. sociolinguistics, as well as anthropology and other, other fields. So they map on really beautifully. <laughs> they do, they do, they do. They, we should definitely have more of those folks because again, selfishly, that means that we are going to get better products because it's better research, right? Because the engineer will just tell you, will just build what you ask them to build. And if you ask them to build something that is not based on reality, they'll build it. You know, they'll have no problem building that. They'll build it very nicely and they will build it in such a way that the code is beautiful, but the foundation is very unsound. And so that's why, you know, I think we selfishly should go and look for these folks and pull them in so they can do and do solid research and discover value and problems so we can solve solve those problems as opposed to solve non-problems, which is often what happens when an engineer and his friend decide to launch a company <laughs> or her friend. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> there's so many examples of the non-problem. That's so true, right? You, you really have to have um, knowledge of how people present themselves in the world, how they use products and services, how they interact with other people, how they interact with things. And, and that's what social scientists are really trained to know how to do both qualitatively and quantitatively. Yeah, and yeah. There's so, so many roles available for them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so linguistics, can you, can, you, can you help us enumerate all the types of linguistics? <laughs> if you could help educate the, the, you know, the folks that when we say linguistics, we're talking about something very broad. Like yes, it's so broad. It's, you can call it the scientific study of language in, in all of its forms. And it really runs the gamut from, you know, all across STEM through social science, through humanity, mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. all of the different ways we have to study language. So, you know, on one hand, you can study how language is uh, spoken or signed. Languages in all forms are structured. So you can, you can look at the, the syntax or the grammar. You can look at how the sounds are put together to form words mm -hmm. or how signs are put together. And you can look at how meaning is created based mm -hmm. on what you say or what you sign in the world, in a specific situation with specific people. How do people create identities in interaction? That's interactional sociolinguistics. How do people develop relationships? How do people misunderstand each other? We have mm. intercultural communication. We've all experienced not being able to understand, um, you know, different types of body language and different ways of speaking, different types of politeness. Um, how do you navigate a hierarchy? How do you talk to people who have power over you in a hierarchy? How do you talk to those who are at your level, who are peers and colleagues? And how do you talk to you know, a child or someone who reports to you in an organization? These are all questions and, and problems that linguists have a systematic way of addressing um, based on mm -hmm. you know, replicable research, based on experimentation based on keen observation of of humans <laughs> interacting so yeah, yeah. we study how people learn language as children how people acquire language later in life we study how the brain organizes language and connects meaning um, so there's psycholinguistics neurolinguistics first and second language acquisition and sociolinguistics, which studies, you know, how language is used in interaction and in society, how, how we mean what we say, and, and all, yeah. the, all the different kinds of messages we send without ever explicitly saying them. Yeah. So 
you know, there, there's so many applications and there's so many different types of methods, both experimental and quantitative, working with huge data sets, big data, and mm-hmm. then the qualitative, minute observation, like the ethnography and, you know, recording of how people talk um, so that we can slow down that interactive process and really analyze language um, turn by turn, analyze like the most minute pauses and what that means in terms of, um, you know, how somebody is evaluating what somebody else is saying. It's, yeah. there's something for everybody. It's, no, no, it's yeah. basically the, <clears throat> everything under the, uh, under the sun, mainly. Yeah, I mean, it's like <laughs> the most basic technology that we have as humans is wielding this amazing tool in so many forms. So, you know, it, it's so normalized that we communicate through, we communicate orally, we communicate through sign, we communicate through writing. It's in everything that we do. So it becomes so normalized that we often don't think yep. about uh, how we mean what we mean and how we can miscommunicate. It's just below the level of our conscious awareness. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, uh... You know, when technology tries to emulate the easiest tasks in language communication, right, between, say, two humans, we discover that it's very, 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 very hard, right? And so we end up with something that is very primitive. I mean, it's, I mean, it's pre, I don't know, pre one year old kind of, uh, you know, competence, <laughs> right? It's, it just reflects how exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, the, the complexity that we take for granted or aren't even aware of because we are such competent uh we competent, are competent. competent in many ways writing in terms of conversation i mean you take a three four five year old it's just stunning what they can do yes you know uh, yeah, yeah it's so it's so true and we you know so much of this knowledge is just implicit we don't think about it at yeah. all and so it's so hard to articulate all of those underlying patterns that influence how we interact in novel situations yeah so it it, that's why it's it's so fascinating because you know we can um, study those underlying patterns it's why linguists are really good at analyzing unstructured data because we have Mm -hmm. so much of it and we have to figure out methods um, both qualitative and quantitative to deal with it yeah yeah 